We may take our seats. So praise the Lord. Uh, I am grateful this afternoon to be amongst you at the invitation of the leadership of this church, something that I never take for granted. My name, as I've been introduced, is uh, Dr. Beatrice Mainge. I'm born again, and I worship at PCA Karen, uh, sitting at the, the chair of health, and also a deacon. Uh, and I bring you greetings from that church. I'm also a practitioner in mental health. I sit in the Kenya Board for Mental Health. Uh, I also run a facility where we work with people who are coming out of mental health issues and especially substance-induced mental health issues. But above all, I love sharing the word of God because I believe I am where I am today because of the grace of God. Today I came with my daughter. Uh, I grew up knowing that it is not very good to walk alone. So I'm here with my daughter, Lois. You can stand up and wave to the church. That's my girl. And my sister is also here. Rose, I saw Rose here. Wave to the church. Yeah, we cannot be preaching about lost within the family. And I stand here looking lost. <laughs> That's why I had to have some members of my family uh, accompany me. So as I'm saying, I'm grateful to be here this morning. And what is exciting me about the topic that we are sharing this uh, afternoon is that when I read the Bible, in the book of Luke chapter 4, verse 18, that is when Jesus gave his first sermon. And he started by giving his job description to the people who were listening to him. Because he, was, he wanted to know them to know from the start that this is why I have come. And we know after that there are people who try to give Jesus other assignments. Actually, there are people who wanted to make him king because of the wisdom that he was oozing as he was preaching. But uh, the Bible records that he actually ran away. He escaped from them because he wanted to confine himself to his mission. And uh, when I look around, I see that uh, most of you are young professionals. And I believe in the organizations where you work, uh, the first question that you'll be asked, maybe not the first, but among the questions that you may be asked when you're being interviewed, is whether you are familiar with the mission and the vision of the organization, isn't it? Because when you don't know the vision, it means that you don't know where the organization is going, and you may not contribute much to taking them where they want to go. And so Jesus gave his mission, and he said, the spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind to set the oppressed free. And that is why you find that wherever Jesus went, any time he encountered a sick person, a blind person, he would stop his entourage to attend to that person because that was within his mission. And so when you talk about looking for those who are lost within the family, then we are squarely within the mission of Jesus Christ. And I want to believe that this is a message that must be exciting Jesus to hear that there is a church that has awoken to his mission. Because I imagine that there is a realization that this church has made that, wait a minute, are we all together? Are we all moving in the same direction? Could we be having some members who are not with us, maybe because of various struggles that they could be having? Could we be having people that even as we are doing praise and worship, as you are worshiping in the church, there are people who are struggling 
maybe because of challenges within the family, maybe because of uh, you know, their you know, chronic illnesses, maybe because of even court cases, land cases, issues that compromise the, the quality of service that we give God. And I want to believe that this is a very good time for the church to actually do what Jesus came into the world to do, and that is to declare freedom for those who are in captive. And I want to believe that all those issues that I have mentioned and many more are the ones that are holding us uh, in captive. That is, you want to worship God, but there is a struggle that you have, and a struggle that maybe no one else knows, because maybe you are ashamed uh, to share it with anyone, or maybe you feel that people will doubt your faith, they will doubt your standing, when they know that you have such a struggle. And that's why it excites me as a psychologist when you talk about looking for those who are lost. Because I know that when we start looking for them and we give them a channel even to speak up about the issues that they may be struggling, then at the end of the day, it will be a win-win situation. Because a church will have people who are free to serve God, people who are free uh, to worship, because they feel that their issues are being addressed. And even if no one is doing something particular about the issue that you are struggling with, just knowing that it is being acknowledged that I have this struggle, it is halfway uh, through uh, the success of that journey. And so I'm excited uh, to share this message of lost within uh, the family. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this uh, afternoon. Thank you, Lord, that you have laid a table for each of us to take a parcel or even a morsel that we can all consume from the table that you have laid. I pray, dear Lord, that as you use me as a vessel to uh, declare your oracles this morning, that we shall be blessed and then all glory and honor will come back to you. This is our prayer of faith in Jesus' name. Now, we are today talking about uh, those who are lost within the family. And the term that is usually used to describe uh, such people is that sometimes we call them the, the black sheep. And when we talk about the, the concept of the black sheep, we are talking about that person in the family who is usually ignored. That when they air their views, you know, people say, ah, don't listen to him. Or even when he says something, it is not taken into consideration. Or maybe someone who is labeled as a troublemaker. That when there are issues happening in the family, maybe there are things that have gotten lost in the family, that person is the first suspect, labeled as the troublemaker. That person who is disfavored or disreputable. That somebody who is considered to be bringing disrespect to the family. Maybe because they are struggling with issues of addiction, they are struggling with the mental health issues, or maybe they have a condition, they, they may have a disability, and so the family feels that, like their respect uh, is, is going down because of that person. We are also talking about the person who feels marginalized in the family. They are treated differently, and so they feel hurt, they feel inadequate, and they feel lonely. And sometimes when you talk about the black sheep, it is not always about those negative things that I have just mentioned. Sometimes we may be labeled as black sheep in the family because we are different. Maybe you are the only one who is employed in that family. And so everyone will want to gang up to see what they can get from you. Or maybe you are the only graduate in that family. Or maybe you have a different color. Maybe everyone in the family is brown. You are the only one who is dark. And sometimes you have caught the eye of your dad looking at you in a suspicious manner. Because they are wondering, hmm, are you part of us? Maybe you are the only one who is short in the family. We are talking about someone who just stands out in a different way. And so you are, you are labeled. And these are the people that we are talking about this morning. 
Because being lost is not a position. It is actually a feeling. And that's why I'm calling it a very subjective feeling. It is how you feel. You can be born in a family of 10, but you still feel like you don't belong. So you are lonely in the midst of many. You are lost in the midst of many. And if we could dissect the mind of those people that we are calling lost, what are some of the things that we can find inside the mind of the lost within the family? And remember, we are saying that some of these things are just perceptions. It is how this person feels. It may not be the correct position, but it is how they feel. And so they perceive neglect. We are dissecting the mind of the lost. They feel neglected, both physically and emotionally, that no one pays attention to me. They feel neglected. They feel abandoned, both physically and emotionally. They just feel like no one is there for me. They have issues, but they look around in the family and they feel there is no one that I can trust with my information. They feel abandoned. Then there is also the lack of attachment feeling like you, you don't have a bond with the family. You don't feel attached. You feel detached from the family. That is what goes on in the mind of what we are calling the black sheep or those who feel lost in the family. There's also the issue of fear in the mind of a lost person. That maybe they have grown up in a family where there is violence or where there are instances of being put down and so they, they, they fear. Even when they have issues that they want to express, they don't have the confidence to express themselves. Then in the mind of those who are lost is the issue of feeling discounted, feeling unappreciated. You know, feeling discounted means that no one appreciates anything that I do. Even when you come home with a report, maybe last time the person was numbered Ten, and then they come home, they are now number eight. There will be the question, the whole time you could only beat two people. Being discounted, meaning that any effort you make, it doesn't count for something. That is the mind of those who are lost. And then also feeling being compared unfavorably. And I believe this is uh, what we are hearing in the media every time as parents, uh, being as not to compare our children. Because we say that you cannot compare the sun and the moon. They all shine their light at different times. No one, uh, we are all gifted differently. So we are saying that being lost is not about where you are, but about how you are. Meaning that you can be lonely in the midst of many people. And we have many examples, and this, Examples are picked very deliberately from the Bible about people who were considered black sheep in their families, but finally they triumphed. Finally, they saved their very families from uh, you know, elimination. We have the example of Joseph. Joseph grew up as a normal child, but you know, with time he started behaving queerly, coming up with some funny dreams of the family bowing to him. And the father also got concerned. Are you also saying that even me and your mother, we shall bow to you? Are you sure you didn't see two things that were standing upright, at least to represent me and your mother? But Joseph was there saying no. Everything was bowing. And at the end of the day, we know the story that Joseph actually saved his family from starvation. That is after his brothers had labeled him a black sheep, they had thrown him into a pit, and they had even sold him into slavery. But at the end of the day, he became the savior of that family. A person like Jabez in the book of Chronicles 4, 9 to 10, we know the story of Jabez, that when his mother gave birth to him, he looked at him and gave him the name Pain. Can you imagine your mother giving birth to you? He looks at you, she looks at you, and the best name that she can find for you is Ruo. He, 
she called him pain. But you are told that after a while, Jabez prayed that, Lord, you may change my name. You may change my circumstances. And his circumstances were changed. A person like Jeremiah, we know the triumphant things that Jeremiah did. And yet he was considered a black sheep in the family. And actually uh, his, his family members even attempted uh, to kill him. People like Gideon and Jephthah considered black sheep, but also became triumphant in saving their families. So what point am I making? I said being lost, it, it is not necessarily the position where you are. It is about the perception, meaning that there is a way that you can change your perception as you regard yourself as a black sheep and you look at these examples. And even today, stories abound about people whose families are feeding from the very hassle that they condemned. True or false? Yes, families are now feeding. The, the things that we told our sons and daughters, how can you do that? That is not a, a job for a person coming from this family. But after some years, uh, that is the hassle that is educating the younger siblings and the younger and even the family. And that's why I, I keep saying even to myself as a parent, because as I preach to you, I'm also preaching to myself, being a mother as well. And I have also found myself in this kind of space where we are doubting the things that our children are, are telling us, that we have to be open-minded. We have to listen to the whole story, like the way the father of Joseph did. Because we are told in the Bible that when Joseph was talking about his dreams, it is his brothers who got very annoyed with him, and they threw him in a pit. But what did his father do? He kept that dream in his remembrance. Read your Bible well, meaning that he took notice. Meaning that we also need to take notice of some of these uh, dreams that our children are telling us about. Let us listen to the whole story. So that there is, if there is any support that we can give them, then we can. We can also look for information around what they are telling us to see whether it's something that is tenable or not. Buana Yesu Asifiwe. We are quiet here. All right, I want to believe that the reason why this topic has been introduced in this church is not just to enumerate the many people who were lost in their families, but it is also to ask ourselves, so then what do we do? What are some of the things that we can do to pull those who are lost to come from their darkness and come into uh, the light? So I want to talk about just uh, uh, six or seven uh, suggestions that we can make about finding the lost, finding the lost. Remember, we say that this is the mission of Jesus, finding those who are lost and freeing them from their captivity. So one of the things that we can do is acknowledge the lost family member. I want to believe that some of the struggles that we have in our families is because sometimes we are in denial. Maybe we have a person who has a disability. We have a person who is struggling with some mental illness or some addiction or any other challenge that we can uh, think of. But as a family, we want to keep it quiet. We want to throw it under the, the, the carpet. And what happens is that uh, when we deny the problem, we make it worse. I was telling uh, the people in the first service that I was attending a workshop at Desta University uh, about two weeks ago. And you were talking about the challenges that are there in the universities. There were lecturers, doctors, and all that. And one of the psychiatrists, child psychiatrists, she said that some of these challenges that we have in the universities are problems that started when these children were still very young. And if someone had detected and taken an action immediately, we would have saved some of these children. And that's why we are saying we need to acknowledge. Because you cannot solve a problem that you are not acknowledging. As long as you are denying the problem, it, you are giving yourself permission not to do anything. So we acknowledge uh, the lost family member. Remember the story of the lost sheep and the lost coin. The, the man who, the shepherd who had 99 sheep, 
He didn't say, I already have enough. He said, even this one, I must look for it. The woman said, I must look for this one coin. So they did not deny the fact that they had lost. The shepherd did not even consider that people would tell him that he was careless. Where were you when this sheep was getting lost? Where were you when your son was getting into addiction? Where were you when this child was getting uh, this kind of challenge? The shepherd did not fear. He just went into the bushes and the thickets to look for the lost sheep. And he was happy when he found it. So we are learning from this scripture that we need to acknowledge. If there is a challenge, we acknowledge. Because the moment we acknowledge, then we can take a step of looking uh, for help and uh, help the member who may be lost. Number two, what we can do, I'm calling it dig for the gold. Dig for the gold. From the scripture that we have read in the book of Jeremiah 1, 4 to 10, God told Jeremiah, before you are conceived, I knew you. Meaning that even this family member who we are considering lost, God has a purpose for them. Before they were conceived in our wombs, God knew them. And because we cannot see the purpose very well, maybe the purpose is hidden in addiction in, you know, being a member of a, a funny group. The purpose is hidden. That's why I'm saying we must dig for that gold until we find it. Am I saying it's easy? Not at all. But am I saying it's necessary? Absolutely. Ask those people who work in the mines. It is not easy to dig for that gold. There's a lot of dirt, there's a lot of digging, there's a lot of sweat, but you know what? They cannot give up because they know that at the bottom of their digging, they will hit the gold. And that's what I'm challenging us this morning, even as parents, that there is gold in every child. And I'm saying every child needs a champion. Everyone may decide to give up, but let every family member have a champion. A champion is that person who never gives up on this person. So let's dig for the gold. God told Jeremiah, do not fear. Don't tell me that you are, you are young. I, I made you for a purpose. And that is the purpose you must go and fulfill. And he sent him uh, with that assurance. So I'm saying not every child is gifted the same way. If they're not bringing us the A's that we are looking for, what is their gold? Because every child comes to this world with their fist clenched like this, meaning that they are coming with their gold, they are coming with their purpose. It is for us as family members to dig uh, for that gold until we find it. When we become the champions of our, ch of, of our family members, giving them the assurance that they need, then uh, we may be able to help them. Number three, taking initiative. Take the initiative. And what do I mean by this? The shepherd and the woman, they did not wait for, this sh for the, the lost sheep to come back. He actually locked the 99 and took the first step in looking uh, for the lost sheep. And even God himself, he took the initiative when he saw how lost the world was. He did not sit back and wait for the world to repent. He sent his son Jesus to die for all of us. And remember, in the three stories that we read about the lost coin, the lost sheep, and the prodigal son, the funny thing about the coin is that it did not know that it was lost, isn't it? It didn't know, but the sheep knew, and so it kept bleating, and maybe that is how it was found. But the coin didn't know that it was lost. So sometimes even now, these family members may not know that they are lost. And that's why we are saying we take the initiative to reach out to them. And remember, a door has opened where we are now searching for those who are lost. And it is for us now to take advantage of this atmosphere to find uh, those who are lost. So we are saying, let's not wait until they make the first move. Let's be uh, the ones to take the initiative. Number four, and you are looking at what we can do to search and find those who are lost within the family. Listen and observe. 
Listen and observe. I've just given the example of Joseph, that when he told his father about the dreams that he was having, his father listened. And so it becomes very important for us to hear the whole story. Let's not cut them short. Let them, what is that you're telling me? What kind of job is that? Well, how will you help yourself with that? It is good to also let us listen to how it is playing out uh, in their mind because it is their dream. It is their purpose. Sometimes we have so many dreams that have gone down the drain because we cut them short. We did not listen. We did not even try to support them. Joseph's father listened to his dreams and kept in uh, remembrance. And sometimes as parents, we have been accused of trying to complete and finish business through our children. Maybe there is a career that you wanted to pursue. Maybe you wanted to become a lawyer, a doctor. And so you are pushing your child to become that. Meaning that you have some unfinished business that you want to complete through your child. And that's why I'm saying it is important for us to listen. Listen to the whole story. And also observe this thing that they are telling me. Do they even act like they can fit in that profession? Do they even do things that, you know, that, that look like they can, you know, fit in that profession? Because even as someone is saying, oh, I want to become a doctor, I want to become a lawyer, uh, you know, if you observe those children, you will, and there are many people who look back and say, this girl, she used to say this and this, and now this is what she has become. So sometimes as their children, our children are telling us things, it may be pointers to the purpose that God has put in uh, their, 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 their minds. But I'm not saying that we support everything because it is not everything that will make sense. And that's why we are listening to the whole story so that we can advise them correctly or we can support them uh, where it is necessary. Number five, we are saying that no cost is too great. And I was telling the people in the first service that being in the board for mental health, we are saying today, as we talk about uh, the, the, this, this expenditure in mental health, we are no longer calling it an expenditure. We are calling it an investment. Because one, every shilling that you invest in mental health, the return is five shillings. And why do I say this? Because we are talking about restoration of people's mental health. We are talking about increase in productivity in the places of work. We are talking about reduction in absenteeism at work. We are even talking about improved health of the people. We are talking about, you know, even uh, family health. And so it is an investment, no longer an expenditure. And that's why I'm saying that even as we support our family members who may be lost, let us not look at it as a cost. Because one thing I can assure you is that restoring a family, a member who is lost, depending on which challenge we are dealing with, it is not a cheap undertaking. Sometimes we have to involve professionals and it doesn't come free. But I'm saying if we look at it as an investment, that if we are able to save this person, it is an investment for himself and also for the family. Look at the story of the lost sheep, if we keep going back to that. Looking for that uh, lost sheep was not an easy thing. The shepherd actually risked his life. There was a risk of him even being eaten by the wild animals, but he did not hesitate. He still went and, uh, to look for the, the, the lost sheep. Even when we look at God himself, he invested in us by sending his son Jesus to come and die for us. And that's why I'm saying, when we look at it as an investment, the burden becomes easier. Because we are saying that every child needs a champion, someone who is ready to even uh, invest in them. Then we are saying, number six, even as we search for those who are lost within our families, every sinner has a future, and every saint has a past. Even this person that we are looking at and we think they are lost, and we think that they are bringing disrespect to our family, they have a future. 
and sometimes we may not know what they will become. And like the examples that I gave, this person that we are calling the black sheep may actually become the savior of this family at some point. Because every sinner has a future and every saint has a past. And that's why even those that we think are not lost, we still need to keep guiding and praying and even being actively involved in their lives because they also have a past. And we may not know how the past, uh, the, the, I mean the future uh, will be. And you're saying that your future actually, it does not determine your future. Sometimes even when we think about uh, the story of the prodigal son, we wonder, is it the prodigal son that was lost or is it his elder brother? And when you, 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 you read between the, the lines, you see that what Jesus was implying is that the elder brother who remained behind was even more lost than the prodigal son. Because he was lost in jealousy. He was lost in complaint to an extent that even when his brother came back, he did not even join the celebration party. He stayed behind. He was not happy that his brother had come back. Actually, the Bible does not tell us where he made an attempt to go and look for his lost brother. So at the end of the day, we may be comfortable looking, paying all the attention to the person that we think is lost, not knowing that even us, we need the redemption of Christ. We need redemption. So uh, the other thing that we can do is actually to take responsibility is to reflect about this family member that we think is lost. What exactly happened? Did I make a contribution to their lostness? There's a word like that. We are talking about taking responsibility because you know we say that it takes two to tangle. And when we see a member who is complaining, a member who is running away, a member who is hiding from us, we need to take a step and ask ourselves, could there be something that I'm doing that is pushing this son or this daughter away from me? And sometimes we take responsibility. In the story of the prodigal son, like I've said, both sons, they were running away from their father. One of them became very bad. He took his possessions and ran away. The other one just, uh, you know, recoiled and became very good. But still he was resentful. So what are we saying? that we need to ask ourselves, could we be making a contribution? And I've seen interesting scenarios, even in the place where I work, where we have one member of a family who digresses from everything, every rule that is made in that family. But when they come for help, as we go through the, you know, the, the, the rehabilitation and the counseling, they become the doorway to the help of the whole family. Because sometimes, you know, you, 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 you look at the interactions in the family, you look at the communication in the family, and you can identify, much as this person is lost, there are issues that need to be tackled even in this family. So this lost member may be the doorway to the help of the whole family. And that's why we are saying that we need to take a moment uh, to reflect and ask ourselves, is there some contribution that we can make? And we say that it is never too late to do the right thing. We say that history can start anywhere. If the communication and the interactions have not been very good, you can start from where you are moving forward. When we dissect, dissected the mind of the lost family member, you remember when we were dissecting and we were saying if you dissect them, what will you find? People who feel neglected, they feel abandoned, they feel left out. And so if we are starting to look for the lost and to try to restore them, I can suggest five A's, eh? five A's of how we can bring back uh, these family members. A number one is about attention. Remember we have talked about family members who feel neglected, who feel abandoned. What if we just start from somewhere by paying attention to them? What is it that you're struggling with? How can I help you? What is the problem? Meaning that you have left everything, like the 99 sheep, and now you are looking for this lost one, and you are asking them, what can I do for you? Attention. Then there is approval. 
Because we cannot say that everything they do is bad. There are those windows of opportunities where they do a nice thing. And we can take that moment to give them approval. I like what you have done. Are you the one who cleaned this car? This is very good. I like what you have done. Because we are trying to correct what may have gone wrong even in their upbringing. Because some of the things that we do, either consciously or unconsciously, is what causes what we are calling the childhood traumas. Number three, the A number three, acceptance. It is okay to be, for you to be who you are. We have talked about times when we compare our children. Why can't you be like so and so? Why can't you behave like so and so? Look at your sister, look at your brother. You are, you are, your younger brother is married with two children and you're just loitering around when you do ever get married. You know, all these comparisons. So we are talking about acceptance. I, I, it's okay for you to be you. When the time comes, everything will fall into place. As we continue to support, to pray, and even to work on the challenges. A number four, admiration. I can learn from you. Is there something, is there a contribution that they are making uh, to that family? However little, we are saying, I admire what you have done. I can learn from you. And the last A is the A of affirmation. That I celebrate your existence. Remember we are saying that those who are lost in the family, they feel like they don't belong. They feel like there is no bond. They feel like there is no connection. But by affirming them, affirming them, building that bond and telling them that you are a member of this family, we celebrate your existence. Because remember, even when the one sheep got lost, he was still a member of their hundred, isn't it? When the, ten, when, the, when the one coin got lost, it was still part of the ten coins. When the prodigal son ran away, when he came back, the father celebrated him as his own son. So even when they are lost in the family, we need to remember that they are still part of the family. And when we get that opportunity, we affirm them that we celebrate you as our son, we celebrate you as our daughter, we celebrate you as our mom, we celebrate you as our dad. And for those who are lost, for those who are feeling lost, because I believe that even as we talk about loss within the family, maybe we are reflecting on our own lives and saying, this is exactly how I feel. Maybe there is someone who is watching us uh, online and saying, that is where I am. Maybe there is someone who has even run away from home. They are sleeping on rickety beds and eating leftovers while they can go back home and have a warm meal at home and sleep on their comfortable bed. We are saying this is the time for them to find their way back home. And I have just three suggestions or three things that I can tell those who feel lost. From the scripture that we read in the book of Matthew 13, verse 53 to 58, who can relate more to being ignored, to feeling different than Jesus himself? We have read that scripture, how Jesus could not even perform miracles in his own hometown because the people looked at him and they wondered, where is he getting this wisdom? Who does he think he is? Isn't this the son of the carpenter? Isn't this the son of Mary? You know, some of them could not even call him son of Joseph because there is something they wanted to emphasize. You are not the son of? You are not the son of Joseph. So Jesus relates, even with those feelings of lostness. I want to imagine that when Jesus was a small boy, he also was trying to understand when his mother tells him, you are conceived by the Holy Spirit. And he was trying to put, put his, you know, to understand what do you mean? Who is this man called the Holy Spirit? Why is it that I don't look like my brothers? Why is it that I don't look like my sisters? And I want to imagine, you know, sometimes I imagine if Jesus grew up in my village where I grew up, and maybe he went to the school where I went. Uh, and you know, in those schools, the, the windows did not have glass. They didn't have the panes, they were just holes. 
And I imagine Jesus coming to school, maybe he has been told to go and come with his father. And he comes with Joseph. And those mischievous boys in my school, they would put their heads out and say, that is not your father. Isn't it? That is how boys would harass others. Go and bring your father. I imagine as a young boy, he must have gone through some of these struggles that we are talking about. We are saying that he was regarded as a prophet without honor. Just because he was born different. He grew up different. He spoke different. Calling himself the son of God. You know, and so he was stigmatized. And his stigmatization did not stop. It went up to the time when they put him on the cross. But one thing we notice about Jesus, and this is a word to those who feel lost, is that he never diverted from his mission. He kept his eyes on the ball. He knew why he had come. He never, uh, he refused destruction. And even when these looked for him to kill him. He knew that this is why I came. And that's why I'm saying even for you who is feeling lost, do you know your purpose? Do you know why you exist? Have you tried to talk to someone so that at least someone can understand these things that you're telling your folks and they seem not to understand? Jesus knew exactly why he came. And even when they ridiculed him, he kept his eyes on the price. But you know what? He finally defeated even death itself. So what we are saying is that we can be feeling lost, but we need to understand to have some self-understanding. There is a very unfortunate statement that we read from that, uh, from that scripture, that Jesus did not perform many miracles in his hometown because they focused on what he was not. They focused on what he could not do, instead of focusing on what he could do. Many other people benefited from the miracles of Jesus, but in his hometown, people remained blind, they remained crippled, because they did not believe in him. And the challenge that I have for all of us, could it be that we are missing some blessings from our family members that we are calling the black sheep? Maybe because we have not been able to get the gold out of them. Maybe these are the people who will rescue uh, this family from uh, whatever challenge. Maybe these people will be the shining stars in our, in our families. Jesus defeated even death, even after being called uh, the son uh, of a carpenter. Number two, what we can do for those who feel lost. I know there are many who may be watching us from their hiding places and they're saying, I can't go back uh, to that house. I know what I did. But we are saying, because you are not a coin, you know the sheep bleated, and that's how the shepherd found him. The prodigal son came back home, and that is how he was restored uh, to his family. And so we are saying, even you who is feeling lost, don't just keep quiet. Don't surrender. Don't let them bury you alive. Come back home. Your family will celebrate you when you come back home just like the prodigal son was celebrated. So don't keep quiet, bleed like the sheep, shout, speak, speak to someone. Let someone know what you're struggling with. Don't keep quiet, ask blind but Myers, and he will tell you, if he had kept quiet, he would have remained in his blindness. But when he heard that Jesus was passing, he shouted, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And his shouting is what stopped Jesus' entourage, and he received his sight. Ask the disciples of Jesus. They decided to be good-mannered and let the Savior sleep. And they said, we don't want to wake him up. And yet, you know, the, their boat was almost capsizing. The winds were blowing. So they said, don't wake him up. But when they realized they were almost going to die, they shouted. They said, we can't keep quiet anymore. Jesus, don't you care that we die? We need to speak. We need to rise up from where we are and speak and shout and look for help. That is a message for those who may be feeling lost. Look for someone that you can